We're talking about Fume, and they look at the problem in a different way. Not every bad habit is wrong, so instead of drastic, uncomfortable changes, why not just remove the bad from your habit? Fume is an innovative, award-winning, flavored air device that does just that. Instead of vapor, Fume uses flavored air. Instead of electronics, Fume is completely natural. And instead of harmful chemicals, Fume uses delicious flavors. You get it, instead of bad, Fume is good. Right now is the best time to start the good habit with Fume. All orders between January 1st to the 14th have buy one, get one cores, so you can stock up for that New Year's resolution. Plus, as a listener of this show, you get an extra 10% off when you use our code. Head to tryfume.com slash scary and use our code scary for an additional 10% off plus BOGO cores until January 14th to help make starting the good habit that much easier. Start the good habit at tryfume.com slash scary to save 10% off the journey pack today. Hi, I'm Stephanie Strange. Want to hear something scary? Hey, Strangelines. I hope you all had a great start to the new year. We are excited for 2024 and we're starting off right with a compilation. So enjoy. Vivek was a young man with a wife and baby at home near Kolkata. Struggling to make ends meet, he took a job as a forest officer. He was finally able to provide for his family, but his job stationed him far from home. He didn't like being away from them, but this particular job paid very well. No one wanted the post at the Dow Hill Forest Camp in West Bengal. It was understood that whoever was on duty overnight near the river had to return to the camp by sunup, or they would fall prey to Pranitha. Long ago, Pranitha was a very beautiful woman who was horribly neglected by her husband. He was never home and valued his career and friends over his wife. The loneliness led to a corrupting rage. And finally, she decided if he couldn't give her his attention, then he would give it to no one at all. One night, when he came home after being gone for days, she decided enough was enough and Pranitha murdered her husband. Fearing the consequences, she fled deep into the forest to live among the tall trees. Eventually, her scattered remains were discovered throughout the forest. Alone and with little to no survival skills, she had been torn apart by the wild boars that roamed those woods. Angry at the fate she suffered, blaming it on her husband's neglect, her spirit became twisted and malevolent. It was said to haunt Dow Hill Forest, searching for men out too late and neglecting their own wives at home. Despite the bonus pay that was also offered for the post, many seasoned officers, married or unmarried, refused it. Vivek, however, didn't believe in ghosts, so he agreed to take the post in Dow Hill. On his first night of rounds, he began to explore deep into the beautiful wilderness. Hours passed, and he found himself near the river just before dawn, his mind running free with thoughts of his wife and child. Feeling a chill set in, he was startled back to reality with the sound of an ear-shattering scream. He looked through the brush and saw in the distance a woman huddled and wailing. Are you hurt? He asked. The woman cried. Hello, I'm lost. I can't find my way out. As Vivek trekked closer, he could make out a beautiful woman. She appeared to be wearing a red sari, traditional attire that many Indian women wore. However, red is the color usually reserved for brides. She looked extremely out of place and really must have been lost. Vivek called over, telling her he'll get her out of there. She could stay at their camp until they could get her home. She agreed. As they trudged through the woods, Vivek offered her his hand over a fallen log. When she placed her hand in his, it felt weightless, as if there was nothing there. He must have been outside for too long, he thought. His hands were too frozen to feel properly. The woman still trailed at a slow pace behind him, 
She seemed tired, terrified, and was trying to hike through the woods in a sari, which was difficult in and of itself. He turned around to see if she needed more help catching up, but when he looked, she was gone. Suddenly, a voice came from up ahead. It was the woman. She shouted, try to catch up. Confused because he didn't see her pass him, he moved quickly to catch up with her. She asked him if he was married, and he said yes. Well, your wife must not be that special to you if you're so far from her and out here with me, she said. Vivek thought about this, missing his wife desperately now. When he looked back for the woman, again, she was ahead of him. This continued to happen. Each time Vivek caught up, she would lag behind. Then in an instant, she would be ahead, waiting for him. It happened one more time, then she called. Try to catch up, Vivek. He froze. He had never told her his name. Vivek began to close the gap so as not to alarm her that something was wrong. But his pulse started to pound through his neck. He had been freezing cold, but was sweating now and trying to act normal. A sliver of light was cast onto the woman as the sun was about to rise. Vivek could now see her sari in greater detail. It wasn't a sari. She was actually draped in thick, dripping blood. Stunned, he knew this must be the bride, Pranitha. If he could just get past her and through the river before the sun came up, he would be safe. He walked close to her again, trying not to vomit at the sight of her blood-drenched body. They were at the river now, and as he took a step into the water, Pranitha tried to stop him. This time, as she touched him, he could feel her bloody hand sticking to his skin. Won't you carry me? I'm so cold, she pleaded. Vivek took this as a sign that she could not cross the running water on her own. With a quick breath, he wrenched his arm away from her and dived headfirst into the river. He kicked as hard as he could to get upstream and away from the gruesome bride. She cackled behind him, a sound only evil could make. You don't deserve your wife. She's the unlucky one. This isn't over, Vivek. It will never be over for you. Vivek finally reached the camp soaked and in shock. The sun was up and he was safe. But he couldn't unhear the cackling from the evil bride or unfeel his arm in her clutches. He had to leave that job and return to his family. He wouldn't neglect his wife like Pranitha was neglected by her husband. The only problem was now the man couldn't stop thinking of the horrors he had found in the forest. Plagued by nightmares and unable to hold a job, Vivek slowly went mad. His wife tried to be patient with him, but eventually she took their daughter and left. The once loving husband and father was now all alone, stuck only with his vivid memories of the horrid woman in the red sari. Pranitha's vengeance was complete. There's more than one way to destroy a man. Thanksgiving's over and that means it's time to put the turkey away. And cold turkey may be good on sandwiches, but there's a better way to break bad habits. And we're not talking about some weird mind voodoo to get you into the gym or the million resolutions you set yourself this year. We're talking about fume and they look at the problem in a different way. Not every bad habit is wrong. So instead of drastic, uncomfortable changes, why not just remove the bad from your habit? Fume is an innovative, award-winning flavored air device that does just that. Instead of vapor, Fume uses flavored air. Instead of electronics, Fume is completely natural. And instead of harmful chemicals, Fume uses delicious flavors. You get it, instead of bad, Fume is good. It's a habit you're free to enjoy and makes replacing your bad habit easy. Your Fume comes with an adjustable airflow dial and is designed with movable parts and magnets for fidgeting, giving your fingers a lot to do, which is helpful for de-stressing and anxiety while breaking your habit. I recently tried it and I really love the flavor, but it's also really discreet and cute and fits right into your pocket. 
You gotta try the new Solana Fume. It's made with a premium walnut barrel and an onyx coated mouthpiece that has a slightly softer finish. Right now is the best time to start the good habit with Fume. All orders between January 1st to the 14th have buy one, get one cores, so you can stock up for that New Year's resolution. Plus, as a listener of this show, you get an extra 10% off when you use our code. Head to tryfume.com slash scary and use our code scary for an additional 10% off plus BOGO cores until January 14th to help make starting the good habit that much easier. Start the good habit at tryfume.com slash scary to save 10% off the journey pack today. Ronan was bummed to be spending summer with his mom, Mindy, and her new boyfriend, Dev. It was Dev's suggestion that they stay at his family's beach resort in Goa, India. He boasted that it was better than any overhyped tourist destination. A palace by the sea for free was all he had to say to get Ronan's mom to agree to the trip. Much to Ronan's dismay, Dev picked him up from the airport alone. Your mom's on a tour of the city, Dev explained. Ronan sighed. His mom had only been dating Dev for a few weeks, and now he was stuck spending quality bonding time with a guy he barely knew. His mom, Mindy, was head over heels for Dev. And while Ronan was still trying to adjust, he didn't blame her. His dad was currently on his honeymoon with his new wife in Hawaii. But as soon as they stepped foot on the resort, Ronan wished he had somehow tagged along to Hawaii with his dad. The hotel didn't live up to the hype that was originally promised. It was run down, bare, and a bit plain. As Dev smiled and motioned toward the building, a snake tattoo on his arm caught Ronan's eye. As he stared at it, weirdly enough, it almost looked like it was staring back. Like the snake eyes seemed to follow him, Ronan rubbed his eyes and shrugged it off as jet lag. His flight out of New Jersey had been long and full of bad plane food. Once inside, Ronan also noticed the place seemed unsettlingly empty. Seeing the look of confusion on Ronan's face, Dev explained that the hotel was undergoing renovations and it was technically closed to the public. Mindy and Ronan were accompanying him while he took care of the place during its off season. Ronan rolled his eyes. Hey, at least no one will hog the Wi-Fi, Dev offered. Before he could complain that the signal wasn't that great, Dev welcomed him with a tray of fresh seafood. It was as if it suddenly appeared. Ronan loved seafood, so he dug in, putting aside his grievances that he was stuck on Dev's work trip for the foreseeable future. We're staying in the Royal Suite, room 1367. Don't get lost. I'm going to go check the grounds, Dev said, leaving Ronan a key. Sitting alone, Ronan felt as if someone was watching him. He heard some crying off in the distance toward the halls. Apprehensive, Ronan followed the noise he was certain sounded like a little girl. Beware the yaksha, he heard a voice as he made his way through the hall. He took my mommy. He'll take yours too. He saw a little girl run into the double doors ahead, followed by a loud splash. When he got closer, the door swung open and he saw a small body floating in the motel swimming pool. It was covered in snake bites. He blinked and the girl was gone. Spooked and wondering what a yaksha was, Ronan tried to look it up on his phone, but only half the page loaded. The yaksha, a spirit that devours travelers in abandoned places. Horrified, Ronan tried to call his mom, but there wasn't a signal. Was Dev a yaksha? It was getting late, so maybe she was already in the room. If he could get to her, he could urge her to leave. He had a feeling that Dev wasn't to be trusted. He put the key into the door and barged into the room. Mom, we have to go. I think Dev isn't. A sharp hiss hit his ears, and there he saw Dev. His snake tattoo glowed green, and Ronan found himself completely unable to move. As he stood dumbfounded and paralyzed, his eyes adjusted to witness Dev for what he truly was. Before him towered a menacing serpentine figure with massive fangs. Dev was the Yaksha. Helplessly locked in the snake's green gaze, Ronan saw everything as he was slowly devoured whole, and then darkness. 
Dev's phone rang as he bagged up the last of Ronan's belongings for disposal. He picked up the call from Ronan's mom as she asked him how Ronan was doing. Holding back a large burp, Dev replied, I'm sorry, love. Ronan decided on Hawaii after all and switched flights. But look on the bright side. It's just us now. There's an old Bengali folk tale that offers a warning for those traveling at night on a dark moon. If you suddenly hear someone call your name from the darkness, never respond, for the night spirits roam ready to prey on the living. Even in the city, the legend of the Nishi still had a presence, an odd warning that Elena's superstitious parents had instilled in her since childhood. Nishis were night spirits of the dead, they didn't get proper burial rituals to pass onto the next plane. So they remained trapped in our world to hunt the living at night, as passage out of this realm by the death of another. Embodied as a night shadow, they'd mimic the voices of loved ones to lure the unsuspecting during the dark moon, but they'd only take one victim. On those nights, parents cautioned their children to not pass through certain areas. These warnings were very far from Elena's mind on the evening she met up with her friend Kamala. They were attending another friend's party. Since neither of them were old enough to drive, they had to ride their bicycles. Though they usually didn't ride their bikes at dusk, they figured sticking to main downtown roads would be safe. But Kamala showed up late. She suggested they take a shortcut through Dhaka Airport Road. Elena's bike tire screeched. No way. She protested, looking up at the moonless sky. What about the disappearances? Sighing, Kamala said, there's always someone saying, beware the Nishi on Dhaka Airport Road. Haven't you seen the videos that say it's a hoax? It's just our parents trying to scare us, like their parents scared them from biking at night. Begrudgingly, Elena agreed, as she knew it would shave off 30 minutes. They cut through the bustling traffic to the grimy side street. Elena felt something was off as soon as they entered the industrial alleyway. They'd been down it dozens of times before during the day, but it took an eerie life at night. She kept having the feeling that someone was watching them. As they pedaled through, the whistle of wind from biking gradually got clearer and clearer, as if the sound was whispering to her. Elena, over and over. Do you hear that? Kamala asked, biking beside her. I do, and we gotta get out of here. Elena responded as the murmur started to sound like her mother's voice. Quickly, she began to accelerate, clamping her teeth together as she rode and forcing herself not to answer. She began to recall her parents' warnings about the Nishi. Never respond. Under any circumstances, never respond. Suddenly, Kamala shouted for her mother. No, Kamala, it's not her. Elena shouted, squinting to try and catch a glimpse of her friend who was right beside her. She immediately knew the Nishi was on their tail. Kamala quickly turned her head back, slowing down with a gasp and jumped off her bike out of Elena's view. The sound of Kamala's empty bicycle crashing against metal grates in the alley. Fear shot through Elena. The Nishi had grabbed her friend. From the corner of her eye, she thought she saw a darkness leech onto Kamala, dragging her behind the trash container. Horrified, she lost control of her bike and spun out, thrown to the ground, hitting her head. Elena, are you okay? Kamala's muffled voice drifted in through the ringing in her ears. I'm so sorry, I thought it would be funny to prank you. Groaning, Elena touched her head. There was blood slowly opening her eyes to see her mother's hand reaching out to help her up. Mom? Elena asked, confused. Elena, take my hand, her mother's voice beckoned. As she reached out, darkness whipped around Elena's hand like vines, and she looked up to see her mother's face morph into a grotesque entity that pulled her close, squeezing the life out of her. Elena struggled, losing consciousness. From the corner of her eye, she saw Kamala peeking out from behind the trash container, covering her mouth, a look of horror in her eyes. Elena struggled to speak her final words, reminding her friend, never respond. 
Thanks so much for listening. Like and share if this video gave you the chills. And don't forget to subscribe and turn on the bell for notifications. See you next time.